A playpen has been selected for our experimental environment because it is one to which the child is well acquainted. The unfamiliar additions include a food dispenser loaded with snacks and a plastic lever, which when pressed exposes a light, causes the dispenser motor to sound and produces the snack reinforcer. Before the actual establishment of lever pressing behavior, it is best to separately establish the function of the light and sound as stimuli which reliably signal an upcoming reinforcement. The child has already been trained to stand near the dispenser as individual snacks were dropped into the food tray, so that a number of activities dealing with the free exploration of the dispenser and whatever else is strange to the child have probably been positively reinforced. This encouragement, coupled with the familiarity of the surroundings in which it was given, will most likely forestall the occurrence of interfering emotional outbursts. However, since the light-sound combination has never been associated with food, any debilitating effects due to this sequence should first be determined, and if need be, any onset of emotional behavior should be allowed to adapt by repeating these pairings a number of times. Throughout this phase of training, the lever has been removed, but the relationship between the light, sound, and reinforcing stimulus is not altered. Dismounting the response mechanism allows us to concentrate upon one behavioral sequence at a time. During this phase of training, the target behavior that is sought is approaching the dispenser shortly after the onset of the light-sound stimuli. No recurring group of activities immediately preceding the action of the light and sound is singled out for reinforcement in order to avoid the building in of an unwanted form of behavior, which later may be found to compete with the lever pressing and which would greatly slow down its rate of acquisition. It is wise to proceed with caution since inadvertently reinforced behaviors created during this phase of training cannot always be easily and efficiently eliminated later on. Of the two stimuli signifying that reinforcement is on its way, it is the sound that is the most practical to utilize, inasmuch as it does not require the satisfaction of any special postural or orientational behaviors on the part of the child. Nevertheless, the light, although employed here primarily for purposes of visual illustration, can also be expected to gain control over performances which involve approaching the dispenser. Many techniques are available to induce the first lever press. An adult could depress the lever and hope that similar action is imitated by the child. Or this act could be shaped by reinforcing responses that successfully approximate lever pressing. Another possibility is to let the child himself discover the reinforcement contingency quite by accidental means, as he does here. That the child goes to the food dispenser after the onset of the light sound stimuli indicates the relevance of the previous training procedure. Now that the child is acquainted with his surroundings and a few lever presses have been reinforced, we can anticipate dramatic changes in the acquisition process. An increasing percentage of time will be devoted to behaviors which quickly produce the snack rewards and, as a result, consumatory behaviors will also rank high on the list of activities in which the child engages. Because of the special programming arrangement, not every lever press will activate the dispenser. Only those responses which follow each other by a delay of one second or more will result in the delivery of a reinforcement. This temporal requirement that successive responses be briefly spaced from one another is imposed in order to eliminate lever presses which persist following a reinforcement. It is hoped that post-reinforcement responding will eventually give way to a chain of substitute activities which deal with getting the snack out of the food tray, eating it, and finally returning to the business of obtaining another snack. Although it may rightly be claimed that the child is not getting his money's worth, it is easy to understand that had each post-reinforcement response been continuously rewarded, the very large number of snacks which would quickly accumulate would strengthen an unwanted behavioral pattern, namely a long response run 
succeeded by one long and pleasant eating period, and naturally, a strong reluctance to return to lever pressing. As responding becomes more economical, we can intensify the frequency of lever pressing by dispensing snack reinforcements only after a certain fixed number of responses have been emitted. Appropriately enough, this programming procedure, whereby a predetermined response quota guarantees reinforcement, is called the fixed ratio schedule. We will readily recognize the properties of fixed ratio schedules in many performances which are paid off on a piece rate basis. The faster one works, the more one may earn. The size of the ratio of responses to reinforcement may be set to any value, but if we wish to promote smooth and sustained performance by fixed ratio schedules, it is best to keep the quota low in the beginning and to gradually raise the stakes. Behavior under the control of fixed ratio schedules occurs in an all or none manner. Once responding starts, it is maintained at a high and uniform rate, with an absence of responding usually seen at a time following receipt of reinforcement. Reinforcements can also be given following a range of ratio values, which as shown in the next few sequences, will vary from 3 to 32 responses, and will have as an average ratio for reinforcements a value of 20 responses. Under this arrangement, known as the variable ratio schedule, reinforcements are still determined by the number of responses emitted. But this number will change from one reinforcement presentation to the next. Thus, unlike extended fixed ratio training, the organism will be unable to discriminate the size of successive ratio values. The result of variable ratio training is a sustained flow of behavior emitted at a vigorous and steady clip. Now that we have built a repertoire of high rate responding, suppose we ask the child to drastically change his style and greatly slow down the pace. This may be done by not reinforcing lever presses unless they are separated at an appropriate interval from each other. It will be recalled that this procedure was employed earlier to eliminate post-reinforcement responding. Then, as now, the child must wait a certain time before a response will be reinforced. Previously, the interval was meager, requiring only a one-second wait. But now, the delay conditions are made much more severe. The child must refrain from responding for at least 12 seconds if he is to earn a reinforcement. The behavioral history of control by fixed ratio and variable ratio schedules makes the task that lies ahead exceedingly arduous and frustrating. Every time the lever is struck, a clock is reset and begins again to time out. If no further responses are made, the clock will automatically run its course unhampered and count down to zero seconds. Then a reinforcement is programmed, and the first response occurring any time afterwards will activate the dispenser. Thus, the child is actually penalized for responding before the timeout period, since each lever press resets the clock and postpones reinforcement. The delivery of reinforcements in this situation is a joint function of two factors, an abstention of lever pressing for at least 12 seconds and a single depression of the lever following that time interval. With continued exposure to the present contingencies, the length of successive periods of non-responding will get longer, thereby providing greater opportunity for reinforcements to be programmed. Right about now, five seconds have expired without a lever press, and if the child should pause for another seven seconds more, the next response will bring a payoff. He got it. When the toddler is again placed in the experimental setting and reinforcements are scheduled as before, 
that is dependent upon the first lever press having an inter-response interval of 12 seconds, there is a return to the high rate of responding seen during the variable ratio regime and during the initial exposure to these new conditions. At this time, however, the child quits responding earlier and some telltale signs that are occasionally associated with extinction make their appearance. To effectively mediate time under the present programming procedures, activities which are incompatible with lever pressing must be discovered and maintained. Turning away from the apparatus is an appropriate enough means of self-control, but even stronger evidence that some resistance to temptation is being established occurs when the child actually faces the dispenser and yet does not operate the lever. Although unbeknownst to him, sufficient time has already passed for a response to have been rewarded. Good adjustment to the temporal requirements that now prevail will call for a reduction in the frequency of responding. And indeed, it is for this very reason that the scheduling conditions utilized here have been described as the differential reinforcement of low rates, or DRL schedule. Currently, the child overextends himself illustrating the first long inter-response interval. Until now, intervals marked by non-responding have mostly been of short duration, with rarely more than three seconds elapsing between neighboring responses. However, should most of the inter-response intervals distribute themselves in the vicinity of 12 seconds, we would be provided with a very convincing proof of the young child's ability to precisely estimate the passage of time. With continued enforcement of the DRL schedule, two classes of behavior can readily be discerned and thoroughly analyzed. One dealing with the probability of the recorded response itself, and the other a more general category, which encompasses all other activities aside from lever pressing. It is difficult to specify ahead of time the exact form and frequency of these other behaviors, since no contingency has been deliberately programmed to exert control over them. Nevertheless, it is possible for a highly ritualistic pattern of idiosyncratic behavior to emerge without forewarning and completely dominate what is done during the DRL interval. All that may be necessary for these time-consuming antics to grow in strength is a chance occurrence between them and a reinforced lever press. It is much too early to gauge the success of these accidental pairings and the life of the superstitions they foster. But even if these overt behaviors fail to materialize, there are many sources of internal stimuli which can help modulate the passage of time during the DRL schedule. A number of attempts must be provided in order to overcome the interfering behavioral effects produced by prior schedule conditions. The high rates of responding, formerly the occasion for increased likelihood of obtaining a reinforcement under the fixed ratio and variable ratio procedures, must now give way to the opposite rule. Stop responding, for when you respond too fast, you are lessening your chances of getting a reward. The child moves to a corner of the playpen, the same corner in which we found him at the beginning of the film, when we question why he behaved the way he did. Now, with an appreciation of his past history in this situation, and with an understanding of what the present reinforcement contingencies entail, we hope that you are better able to answer that question.